Good evening, I'm Sandra Coughlin, principal of Glumbard South High School. I would like to welcome our audience to tonight's presentation about sexual violence. Tonight's presenters include building administrators, educators, our in-building mental health professional, as well as a community therapist. Sexual violence is a serious topic and one that needs to be talked about, especially after allegations were made about sexual violence and safety at Glumbard South. While allegations were investigated and handled properly, we feel there is a need to continue educating our students and community about sexual violence and how Glumbard South responds appropriately to such incidences involving our students. This presentation is intended for mature audiences and students who seek an understanding about sexual misconduct, assault, and violence. A similar presentation is currently provided to our students in health classes and PE classes in the near future. When talking about sexual misconduct, assault, abuse, and violence, it's important to notify the viewers that this presentation may be considered sensitive and while not graphic in nature, the content may be triggering to some. To respond to those who need support, you will see hotline numbers on many slides. These numbers are available to anyone at any time. If you would like to speak to someone in the Glumbard South Student Services Department, please reach out to that person directly, via email, or by phone during school hours between 7.30 and 245. You can find that number at the end of this presentation. Tonight's webinar agenda looks like this. The content of this, of this webinar was developed in conjunction with a Glumbard South student group who, who's focused on educating students about sexual violence, the role of the school in building and out of building supports. I would like to have our panelists introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Jose Jaramillo, Assistant Principal for Student Services. Good evening, my name is Ms. Hansen, one of the social workers at Glenbard South. Hello, I'm Ryan Chrissy. I'm a special educator and the head football coach at Glenbard South. Hi, my name is Lisa Helley. I am a health teacher here at Glenbard South. Hi, I'm Brittany Palmer, and I am a health teacher at Glenbard South. Hello, I'm Deanna Filkins, and I'm the director of Glen Ellen Youth and Family Counseling Services and a licensed clinical social worker. There are a few definitions that I would like to cover before diving into the rest of the presentation. And we feel it is important to define these key terms that will be mentioned and discuss the similarities and the differences between these definitions. The terms that will be covered are often used interchangeably and sometimes used to describe different types of situations and scenarios. Some of the terms mentioned may resonate with our viewers on a personal level. If you have specific questions about the terms being defined or want further clarification on the terms and their definitions, you can call the National Sexual Assault Hotline, often referred to as RAIN, and they can provide further clarification and or direct you to the appropriate agency that can help you further. The first term I want to cover is sexual assault. Sexual assault, also commonly referred to as rape, is an act in which a person intentionally sexually touches another person without that person's consent. An assault can be coerced. In other words, a person could be pressured or forced to engage in a sexual act against their will. Sexual assault is a form of the overarching category of sexual violence. The second definition I want to highlight is sexual harassment. Sexual harassment is a term used to refer to unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, and other verbal or physical harassment of a sexual nature. What sets sexual harassment 
apart from other forms of sexual violence, is that harassment involves intimidating or becoming aggressive and forceful with a person because of their sex or gender. Sexual harassment is also a form of sexual violence. The third term I want to mention is sexual abuse. Sexual abuse is defined as unwanted sexual activity by a parent, guardian, or caregiver by use of force, threats, intimidation, and or taking advantage of victims who are not able to give consent. What distinguishes sexual abuse from other forms of sexual violence is that sexual abuse is an act that is done by the hands of a caregiver. Sexual abuse is mostly used when describing sexual violence that occurs towards a child or a minor person. It is important to note once again that the terms I just went over are often used interchangeably. The terms were researched through reputable sources, including RAIN, the Aaron's Law website resource, and the American Psychological Association. What is Aaron's Law? Aaron's Law is named after childhood sexual assault survivor, author, speaker, and activist, Aaron Marin. Aaron's Law requires that all public schools in Illinois implement a prevention-oriented child sexual abuse program that teaches students in grades pre-K through 12th grade age appropriate techniques to recognize child sexual abuse and how to tell a trusted adult. To teach school personnel about child sexual abuse and sexual assault, and to teach parents and guardians how to recognize the warning signs of child sexual abuse plus needed assistance, referral, or resource information to support sexually abused children and their families. Currently, students at Glenbard South are being educated about Aaron's Law in our freshman health classes, as well as our 10th grade driver education classes, our 9th and 12th grade physical education classes as well. The curriculum covers consent and coercion scenarios, students' rights, and healthy relationships. The video that will be played is about Aaron's journey. I came from a family of three girls, and I felt like I had the perfect life. I was the happiest little five and six year old and had so much fun as a child. I struggled for years in my childhood with watching my family suffer. It, um, it tore our family apart. I went down the path of self-injury, suicide attempt, very depressed. This could be happening to your child. This can be happening to your next door neighbor, your best friend you've known your entire childhood. And you had no idea because of the shame that people carry. When I was a kindergartner, um, I had been asked by my best friend, Ashley, and me to spend the night. And I was excited, that little kid going off to my first sleepover. And after watching a Little Mermaid, we went into her room to go to sleep. She climbed up in her bed and me on the ground in my little sleeping bag, fell asleep, and eventually I woke up to the bedroom door opening and looked over there and there her uncle was. I thought he was checking to make sure we were asleep. And instead he closed the door, came down to where I was on the ground, told me to be quiet, and I did. I stayed quiet, he sexually abused me, and told me this is our little secret, no one will believe you. I know where you live, Aaron. I'll come get you. I think he promised my best friend I would never tell anybody what her uncle was doing. What is your name? Aaron. And then how old are you? Eight. My abuse ended when I was eight and a half and we moved. Suddenly I'm going to a new school, making new friends. Little did I realize by moving was getting me that much closer to the next perpetrator in my life. This time, it was my cousin, Brian. Wake up to him sexually abusing me. And for the next almost two years, he repeatedly tells me, this is our secret. No one will believe you. You have no proof that I did this. And I believed it. I believed him that no one would believe me. So I stayed silent because my only education came from these perpetrators. At 13 years old, my 11-year-old sister came to me with the same secret. My little sister blurted out the words, Brian's gross, and I knew instantly what that meant. 
and was just filled with anger and rage. So we broke our silence, our abuse ended, reclaimed our voice, and that was the first step in moving forward and healing our lives. Because I had my parents' support in believing my sister and I, I wanted other people to realize that there is support for them out there as well. Looking back on my childhood, I learned tornado drills, bus drills, fire drills. Yet there was nothing on how to speak up and tell if you're being abused. So I created Aaron's Law in my home state of Illinois. All this money, you made two dollars, extra five dollars. Stop, please! She just goes, okay. Plus my mom bought this fresh lemonade just to make it look Back in 2010, I was working my full-time master's level job as a counselor working with youth. I quit my job, tried to figure out a way of how I was gonna explain to people that, you know, I'm gonna speak about educating kids on the prevention of abuse, because my own state lawmaker said, Aaron, we don't talk about that in society. They will never teach this in school. And I made it my mission not just to get this passed in Illinois, but I made it a mission to travel to all 50 states, testifying to lawmakers on the importance on this. And I tell these lawmakers I'm not going away. This is something that everyone should stand behind. Aaron's law requires every year child sexual abuse to be taught in public schools. So once a year, students must be informed on personal body safety, on how to speak up and tell the differences between safe and unsafe touch, safe and unsafe secrets, and give Keithy's voice and educate our educators on warning signs to look for. You know, how to properly handle when a child discloses abuse. And there are multiple stories as a result of Aaron's law being passed. We need to end the stigma and shame around this subject. Legislators, parents, teachers, they need to wake up and realize that this is going on. You all know somebody that this has happened to. I really want parents to see the importance behind this. And I want kids to reclaim their voice and be able to break their silence and end their suffering. That is my mission in life. I don't care if this takes me a lifetime and, you know, I'm doing this at 90 years old. This is, you know, my calling in life, and I'm going to be fighting for this until the end. I came. All right, next we're going to be talking about what is sexual consent. Sexual consent is a really important topic for everyone to understand, especially high school students. Our, stu our students learn about consent during their health class each year. And starting this year, PE classes will also be covering the issue. Sexual consent is an agreement to participate in sexual activity. Each person needs to check in with their partner to make sure that they wanna be sexual. Clear and honest communication between partners is key. We're going to watch a short video called Consent and Tea. This video is a metaphor about consenting to sex and is used in health class to talk about the issue of consent. If you're still struggling with consent, just imagine instead of initiating sex, you're making them a cup of tea. You say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they go, oh my God, I would love a cup of tea, thank you. Then you know they want a cup of tea. If you say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they're like, uh, you know, I'm not really sure. Uh, then you could make them a cup of tea or not, but be aware they might not drink it. And if they don't drink it, then, and this is the important part, don't make them drink it. Just because you made it doesn't mean you are entitled to watch them drink it. And if they say no, thank you, then don't make them tea at all. Just don't make them tea. Don't make them drink tea. Don't get annoyed at them for not wanting tea. They just don't want tea, okay? They might say, yes, please, that's kind of you. And then when the tea arrives, they actually don't want the tea at all. Sure, that's kind of annoying as you've gone to all the effort of making the tea, 
but they remain under no obligation to drink the tea. They did want tea, now they don't. Some people change their mind in the time that it takes to boil the kettle, brew the tea, and add the milk. And it's okay for people to change their mind. And you are still not entitled to watch them drink it. And if they're unconscious, don't make them tea. Unconscious people don't want tea. And they can't answer the question, do you want tea? Because they're unconscious. Okay, maybe they were conscious when you asked them if they wanted tea. And they said yes. But in the time it took you to boil the kettle, brew the tea, and add the milk, they are now unconscious. You should just put the tea down. Make sure the unconscious person is safe. And this is the important part again. Don't make them drink the tea. They said yes then, sure, but unconscious people don't want tea. If someone said yes to tea, started drinking it, and then passed out before they'd finished it, don't keep on pouring it down their throat. Take the tea away. Make sure they're safe because unconscious people don't want tea. Trust me on this. If someone said yes to tea around your house last Saturday, that doesn't mean they want you to make them tea all the time. They don't want you to come around to their place unexpectedly and make them tea and force them to drink it going, but you wanted tea last week. Or to wake up to find you pouring tea down their throat going, but you wanted tea last night. But if you can understand how completely ludicrous it is to force people to have tea when they don't want tea, and you're able to understand when people don't want tea, then how hard is it to understand it when it comes to sex? Whether it's tea or sex, consent is everything. And on that note, I'm going to go make myself a cup of tea. As it was stated before, consent is key and also talking about sexual boundaries and just overall communication is so vital. When talking about sexual boundaries, that does not start and stop with physical interactions. Those boundaries can include emotional and digital interactions that can take place through texting, direct messaging, or posts on social media. Setting sexual boundaries is a necessity in any relationship where physical intimacy may be part of that relationship. It's important to clearly communicate with your partner on what you are comfortable with and what you are not comfortable with. And a way to set boundaries is to use strong communication skills. Communication is key in any relationship. Use the word no boldly. Give strong nonverbal messages so there is no gray area during these times of communication. And remember, changing your mind is okay. Just because sexual consent was given on one day, it may be different on another day. Situations regarding consent and, res and, and respecting consent are not always black and white. There are different kinds of situations in which a person would give consent to something, for example, sexual encounter, snuggling, or even simply kissing, but a person may not give their consent in these situations, and it makes clear communication, it takes clear communication to avoid troubling situations. So what does that look like, or what does that sound like? Clearly use the word no, say it boldly, no, stop, I'm not comfortable with this. I told you this first, but I don't want to do it now. Get away from me. It is so important that you are clear with what you are saying and how we set sexual boundaries. Who can sexual abuse or sexual assault be reported to at school? All of the staff listed below are mandated reporters. A mandated reporter is an individual who holds a professional position as a social worker, teacher, counselor that requires him or her to report the, to the appropriate state agency cases of child abuse that he or she has reasonable cause to suspect. Mental health professionals can be found in the school counseling office. Students that come forward to the student services office can be assured that they will maintain confidentiality with information that is given to them. What does staff do immediately when a, a report is made al alleging sexual violence? When a sexual allegation is reported to the school, the school contacts the parents or guardians to notify them of the situation. Additionally, the school contacts DCFS and the school resource officer who is a member of the DuPage Sheriff's Office when there is a report of sexual violence. The police conduct investigations involving sexual violence. 
As a school, we work with our students that are minors and are unable to disclose information to the public regarding incidents of sexual violence. The goal of Glenbard South is to support all students towards academic success while fostering social and emotional development. We recognize that students may experience social conflict that requires the school to intervene and make efforts to ensure that those students have minimal contact during the school day. We will strive for students to be able to attend school comfortably and remain academically focused with necessary supports. What does school staff do to support students after a report of alleged sexual violence has been made to a school staff member? At Glenbard South, we want all of our students to feel safe and access the school as comfortable as a comfortable and supportive environment. The role of the public school does not start and end with teaching math, science, history, English. We recognize that non-academic circumstances can and do significantly impact a student's ability to be successful when they are at school. Glumbard South has an, ex an excellent student services team of professionals who are committed to supporting all students as they navigate high school. Within the student services department is the school counseling office. The school counseling office is comprised of school counselors, social workers, and a school psychologist who are all able to support students with a wide variety of things, which broadly include mental health, social emotional concerns, academic goals, and post-secondary plans. School counselors, social workers, and school psychologists are mental health interventionists who specialize in supporting students through their educational experience using a mental health lens. In the event a student comes forward alleging that sexual violence has occurred, there are a number of ways that the school supports these students. We first and foremost want students to feel as though they have safe places to go inside and outside of school. In order to ensure that students feel supported each day, a safety plan may be developed with a combination of school staff, family members, and student participation. Within the safety plan, Supports inside and outside of the school will be identified and reinforced as needed. Safe places in school could include the school counseling office, amongst the school counselor or the social worker, for example, the nurse's office, a coach's office, maybe even a classroom where you have class with a trusted teacher every day. We find it very important for students to be equipped with the knowledge of safe places that they can access outside of school as well, including family member homes, a friend's house, a therapist's office, or maybe even your local law enforcement office. In addition to identifying safe places to go inside and outside of school, it is important for students to have safe people that they trust who they can access when needed, such as a teacher, a coach, a dean, or the school psychologist. Outside of school, trusted adults may include a family member, a private therapist, or a friend's parent. Student services staff have access to many local and national community resources to support students who have been impacted by sexual violence. We have these resources readily available to us and we have great relationships with our community partners. I wanna reintroduce Deanna Filkins, the director for Glen Ellen Youth and Family Counseling Services, who will talk to us further about local and national community resources. If you or someone you know have been impacted by sexual violence, sexual assault, harassment or abuse, there are many ways to get help locally in our community. As mentioned previously by Ms. Hansen, the first place to start is to call the National Sexual Assault Hotline, or RAIN. The number is 1-800-656-HOPE. This will connect you with a trained professional from a sexual assault service provider in your local area. Someone will talk to you through what happened and provide referrals for long-term care and support that is local to your community. Secondly, contact DCFS or your local police to file a report and initiate services. Mind, if you are a minor as previously stated and you report to someone like a teacher, counselor, or doctors, these are mandated reporters and the police and DCFS will be contacted no matter what. And lastly, get professional help. Don't try to do it all your, on your own or treat someone you know who's suffering. There are plenty of local support groups and licensed counselors and therapists to help heal. If you need anything, our agency, Glen Ellen Youth and Family Counseling Service, provides outpatient counseling for individuals and families who may be impacted by sexual violence.
as described at the beginning of this webinar, we posted helplines throughout the presentation and have these resources listed here for your reference. This information will also be on our home webpage. In closing, I want to thank you, the audience members, for watching this presentation about sexual violence. It is our goal to provide important information that covers the definitions the st and the steps that should be followed uh, in the case of assault. I want to thank our presenters this evening, Mr. Jaramillo, Ms. Hansen, Ms. Helly, Ms. Falcons, Mr. Chrissy, and Ms. Palmer, as well as the student group that came forward to provide input on the awareness of this webinar. So where do we go in the future? Our plan is to have a second webinar towards the beginning of next year when we will talk about resources and procedures in our community and how Glumbard South partners with those agencies. This information will also be taught in health classes and become part of the PE curriculum in the future. As I stated before, the resources that we've shown and discussed tonight will be posted in us, our students Schoology homepage, as well as our Glumbard South homepage. Parents are able to access this information through Schoology through their Power School registration. We hope that you have found tonight's information valuable and we encourage you to reach out to the Glumbard South Student Services team or a national organization should you feel that you need to have a connection with an adult or report a sexual allegation. Thank you so much. We appreciate your attention. Have a good evening.